Good evening, and thank you for coming to the Governor of Alberta's public information session regarding the municipal inspection of the city of Chestermere. My name is Jordan Redshaw, and I will be your moderator this evening. Before we go any further, I'd like to give a quick safety briefing. Should we need to evacuate for any reason, there are four exits from this hall. Two are at the left and right of me at the front of the room, and two are at the back corners of the room. For those using the exit into the main building, this one over here on my left, please turn at the left at the intersection and exit the building. If we need to evacuate, the muster point for this room is at the north side of the parking lot near the field, which is from where I'm standing over my right shoulder. If you haven't already done so, I'll ask you please to please silence your phone uh, so that we can all have a, a good discussion here tonight. I'd also like to acknowledge that we are gathered here today on the traditional territory of the signatories to Treaty 7. I also acknowledge that the Métis people of Alberta who have a deep connection to this, with this land. Now, moving on with this evening's session, I'd like to introduce the speakers and panelists. With me tonight, we have Ms. Brandy Cox, the Deputy Minister of Municipal Affairs with the Government of Alberta, as well as Assistant Deputy Minister Gary Sandberg. We have Mr. George Cuff, the Principal Management Consultant at George Cuff & Associates, who conducted the municipal inspection of the City of Chestermere. And we have Alberta Municipal Affairs Minister, the Honorable Rebecca Schultz. Thank you to everyone who has gathered here this evening and to those of you who are joining us through the live stream for taking the time out of your schedules to learn more about the City of Chestermere Municipal Inspection. I work for National Public Relations and the Government of Alberta has asked me here to be here tonight to bring an extra element of impartiality to this discussion. For the record, I have not had any involvement in this Chestermere inspection whatsoever. I'm here because I've facilitated and supported many discussions between Alberta, Albertans and different levels of government. It's democracy in action, and I'm passionate about people getting involved in their communities. Over the years, I've been in a lot of rooms with a lot of people who have been upset with one order of government or another for various reasons, as well as communities that have been divided and polarized on possible courses of action. Tonight, the government of Alberta and its representatives are here to share information directly with you and you will have the opportunity to ask questions about the courses of action relating to the municipal inspection of the city of Chestermere. First, we are going to hear from the Deputy Minister Brandy Cox, who will explain what a municipal inspection is, how it works, and why one was ordered for the city of Chestermere. Then we are going to hear, hear from Mr. George Cuff, who experienced, the experienced governance consultant who was hired by the Alberta government to conduct the inspection. He is going to share the methodology behind the inspection, what it found and what the report recommends as next steps. Then we are going to hear from the Honorable Rebe Minister Rebecca Schulz about some decisions she had made, has made based on the results of the inspection and next steps for the city of Chestermere. Once we've heard from the minister, we will open the floor to questions. Before we get into the presentations and the question period, we need to set the one rule for tonight, which is the fundamental rule of respect. The entire discussion this evening is going to be undertaken with respect among everyone in the room, which includes your neighbors and the presenters. I really mean this, and I'm going to say it now very clearly. If at any point this meeting is disrupted to the extent that it is not a safe space for, dis for a respectful discussion and information session sharing, the government, the government of Alberta has granted me the authority to end the meeting. I'm going to ask you to please hold your questions until after all three of our speakers have completed their presentations. There are pens and paper on your table, and I encourage you to write down any questions you have so that you can ask them when the time comes. I expect we'll take about an hour, maybe a little more to get through all three presentations, and then sometime around 7.30 p.m., we'll open the floor to questions. We will have people with microphones circulating in the room. If you have a question about any of our topics, the inspection process, the inspection report, or the minister's decisions, you'll have the opportunity to raise your hand and someone with a microphone will come to you. The staff will hold the microphone for you. They will not give the microphone to you. I would ask that you state your name, ask clear, straightforward questions about the information that is shared with you tonight. And if you don't have a microphone in front of you, please don't shout out your question. Please be patient, listen to what others have to say, and we will get to your question in due course. I promise that I will do my very best to ensure that everyone who has a question gets an opportunity to ask it and receive a fair answer. We booked this session until 8 p.m. tonight, but we have a little bit of leeway at the back end. So if there are still some questions waiting at that time, we'll do our best to get to answer them. If we don't get to all the questions tonight, you'll be able to email your question to Alberta Municipal Affairs and they will respond. 
We are all sharing this time together to learn about this inspection and what it means for the city of Chestermere. So please keep that shared purpose in mind throughout the evening and remember that you are surrounded by your neighbors. So with that understood, I will invite Deputy Minister Brandy Cox to explain how we came to be gathered here this evening, Ms. Cox. Well, thank you for that introduction, Jordan, and good evening, everyone. As Jordan said, my name is Brandy Cox, and I'm the Deputy Minister of Alberta Municipal Affairs. I've been with the Government of Alberta for about 20 years in various ministries and in various roles. I've been the Deputy Minister of Municipal Affairs for a little less than two years, but I've worked with municipalities for many years now, and I'm a strong believer in the importance of responsible, accountable local government. A municipal inspection is a rare and extraordinary measure for the Alberta government to take for one basic reason. We respect and value local democracy. That should come as no surprise. The Alberta government is a democratic institution, so of course it respects democracy. But in municipal affairs, our respect for democracy goes beyond personal philosophy or preference. A basic respect for local governments and local democratic decision-making is built right into our governing legislation, the Municipal Government Act. Throughout this, I will probably refer to that more commonly as the MGA. I'll get into what the Act says about municipal inspections in a moment, but first I need to explain a fundamental principle that the Act upholds, which is to respect the autonomy of local governments and the leaders who are elected by the local residents to represent them. It is the residents of a community who elect their city council, and it is the residents of the community that the council should be accountable to. For that reason, the Municipal Government Act does not give the provincial government any authority to, to directly intervene into the operations of a duly elected city council unless there are extraordinary circumstances, and we take that very seriously. As a general rule, municipal affairs doesn't go looking for reasons or opportunities to intervene in the governance and administration of local municipal governments. As a ministry, we understand that municipal councils have tough jobs to do and tough decisions to make. That's what they're elected to do. So we don't get involved simply because a resident or a group of residents doesn't like a particular decision that a council makes. Councils will make tough decisions and sometimes people will disagree with those decisions. But if a council has the authority to make those decisions and follows the legislative processes, then there's no role for municipal affairs and the council will simply be accountable to their residents for the decisions that they make through the normal democratic mechanisms, such as elections. Municipal affairs is not concerned with whether or not a council or its decisions are popular. We're concerned with whether the council and administration are acting effectively and in accordance with their duties and obligations under the legislation. We would much prefer that municipalities function properly in the service of their residents, which is the case for almost all of Alberta's 332 municipalities almost all of the time. But once in a while, a situation arises where the concerns seem to run deeper than just an unpopular decision, where there are concerns about whether a local government is operating properly and following the legislation. In those cases, the Minister of Municipal Affairs has the authority to order an, a municipal inspection under Section 571 of the Municipal Government Act. To conduct an inspection, the minister typically appoints an independent outside expert to provide an objective third-party review. A municipal inspector typically examines past and ongoing issues, reviews the municipality's operations and management, and produces a report with recommendations for ministerial consideration upon completion of the inspection. A municipal inspection involves collecting information from a range of sources, public and municipal documents, members of the community, staff and former staff, and elected officials. If, as a result of the inspection, the minister considers that the municipality is managed in an irregular, improper, or improvident manner, the minister may direct the municipality to take any action that the minister considers proper in those circumstances. While the terms irregular, improper, and improvident are not defined in the MGA, they can be generally defined along the following lines. Something that is irregular is not following the rules about what should be done. Something which is improper 
is something which deviates from fact, truth, or accepted usage. In other words, it doesn't conform to accepted standards. Finally, something which is improvident lacks foresight. It doesn't consider future needs and is not wise or sensible regarding money. The intended outcome of a municipal inspection is to support the municipality in providing sound governance and appropriate administrative practices in the service of the community. While the process and format of an inspection are not defined in the Municipal Government Act, fairness is an important consideration in the process, and you'll hear more about that in a few moments. One last thing that I should say about the legislation so that there is no misunderstanding here tonight. The Municipal Government Act does not give the Minister of Municipal Affairs the authority to simply dismiss members of council, except in very specific circumstances. To briefly explain, this is how that process would work. Firstly, the Minister must order an inspection. Secondly, based on that inspection, the Minister must consider that the municipality is managed in an irregular, improper or improvident manner. Thirdly, the Minister must issue directives to the municipality. Fourth, the municipality must fail to comply with the directive to the Minister's satisfaction, and the Minister must consider that the municipality continues to be managed in an irregular, improper or improvident manner, and all reasonable efforts to resolve the situation must have been attempted and been unsuccessful. Fifthly, the Minister must provide the municipality with notice of her intent to make one or more additional orders and 14 days in which to respond. It is only at the end of the 14 days that the Minister has the authority to make additional orders, such as withholding any grants owing to the municipality, suspending Council's bylaw making authority, or dismiss dismissing the Council or any member of it or the Chief Administrative Officer. I share that so that everyone here clearly understands the requirements of the Municipal Government Act. So with that bit of background context, how did we get here? Starting in January 2022, Municipal Affairs started to receive emails and phone calls of concern from members of the public, current and former employees, and former and current members of Council. These letters shared concerns of the about the governance and conduct of the City of Chestermere Mayor and Council. At first, our advice to those who contacted us was to try to work with Council and Administration to address their concerns. This is standard practice in Municipal Affairs, and again this reflects our basic respect for locally elected governments. However, as the number of concerns increased, and as the nature of the concerns became more serious, the Minister of, day, of the Day, the Honourable Rick McIver, raised these concerns with the Mayor of Chestermere in a meeting on February 17, 2022, and invited him to share his perspective. The Mayor provided a response on February 24, 2022. The Minister remained concerned, and feeling that more information was needed, he ordered a preliminary review to gain context around the concerns and to provide further opportunity for city officials to be heard. A preliminary review involves Municipal Affairs staff conducting interviews with Council members, members of administration, and others who may have expressed concerns, as well as a review of available documents such as Council minutes and other relevant publicly available materials. The preliminary review identified multiple items of potentially significant concern related to the governance and legislative infractions. Based on these findings, the Minister ordered a municipal inspection on May 9, 2022, and appointed Mr. George Cuff as the inspector. In a few moments, Mr. Cuff will be providing a detailed walkthrough of the inspection process and his findings. It's important here to note that the Chestermere inspection report was complete and delivered to the Minister on September 1, 2022. Events that happened since September 1st are not addressed in the inspection report, and they won't be directly addressed here tonight. That's not to say that they may not be addressed in the future, but they're not included in the inspection report, and so they're not a focus of tonight's presentations. Now, while the inspection report was submitted to the Minister on September 1st, that's not the end of the process. On November 2nd, 2022, senior ministry officials and the inspector met virtually with Chestermere Council and senior administration to share a copy of the inspection report with them as well as the possible directives that the Minister was considering. Council and senior administration were explicitly advised of their right to consult legal counsel, and they were given more than one month, 
until December 9, 2022, to provide any feedback to the minister before the minister made any decision on next steps. The minister also met with council and members of senior administration on February 8th of this year, and each individual was given an opportunity to share their perspectives with the minister in person. And that brings us to this evening. Before I conclude my remarks, I would like to reiterate one very important point. The goal of municipal affairs now and at all times throughout this process has been and still remains to help Chestermere City Council function properly and to deliver good governance for Chestermere residents. We have done that by following the requirements of the legislation and by following a process that has been designed to provide fairness and an opportunity to be heard to all of those directly affected. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Minister Cox. Next, I'd like to introduce Mr. George Cuff, whose firm was hired by the Alberta government in May of last year to conduct the Chestermere inspection. Mr. Cuff is broadly recognized as one of Canada's leading experts in the principles of governance and effective organizations. Since founding his consulting company in 1984, Mr. Cuff has consulted or has focused on providing advice and counsel to rural and urban governments, providing departments and agencies and other groups involved in some aspect of government or governance and public service. Now I will turn to him and turn to him to explain how he conducted the Chestermere inspection and what he found, Mr. Cuff. Thank you very much and good evening ladies and gentlemen. I'm George Cuff and I'm uh, delighted to be here. I appreciate the kind introduction and the good uh, tone setting by uh, the deputy minister. I was as stated asked to act as the inspector for this inspection. Uh, just to clear up any misconceptions, I came into this study with no bias. I admit your prior CAO on two previous occasions, both of which were seminars for municipalities which he served, one was Kindersley, one was Chestermere. Uh, both types of seminars differed in that the first one was a general seminar around rules and roles and responsibilities. The second one was how a council should work with a brand new CAO. I didn't have any relationship to the previous mayor that I'm aware of other than the seminar, which was intended to speak to the impact of a CAO. And that was of course held during the term of this last council prior to this one. I was not on a first name basis with any member of your council, but I may have met one or more previously and I'm not quite frankly sure of that. My bias is that I'm a strong proponent of good governance. My experience with 1100 other public sector organizations, most of which were municipalities, would suggest that I understand how a council mayor CAO system works. In total, in terms of the three people on the team doing this inspection, we represented 100 years of consulting and another 20 plus years of elected official or administrative experience. At my orientation seminar for this council last November, I presented on the roles and functions of council and management. Now that's for the current council. I stressed the separation of the council and CAO and no one pushed back. We did not comment on issues under the current review, by the way, such as the CUI, the Chestermere Utility Corporation, or any additional compensation payouts. They were not a part of this particular review because they were under separate uh, audit. The actual inspection process was May 11th to September 22nd last year, as the deputy had said. What follows is a brief synopsis of the work, the full 200 page report will be available online after tonight's meeting. And I trust that you uh, would enjoy the review. In terms of the study process, uh, I spoke with the ministry with regard to process and timing in terms of expectations. The ministry knows and I know that they don't tell me what to find, they don't tell me what to do. They talk about simply this is the request and this is the terms of reference for an inspection partly of which I would have known already because I've conducted probably eight or 10 prior inspections. I interviewed each member of council, which I would do under most studies, including follow-up phone calls. 
I spent an hour to an hour and a half with council members, and based on my own records, I spent uh, at minimum nine plus hours with the mayor. I did in-person and telephone or Zoom interviews with current members of the senior staff and their advisors. I did telephone interviews with former employees of the city and members of the public who called or who wrote. All interviewees were advised that they had the right to call legal counsel if they so desired. I reviewed documentation from the city, which included background reports, audit reports, organization structures, position descriptions, strategic planning documents, meeting minutes, all of above. I requested permission to speak with the city's former legal counsel. Uh, the position, permission was not granted. I reviewed video of a broad cross-section of the council and committee meetings along with one of my associates who has a background in municipal legislative services. It's also interesting and worthy to note that at or near the conclusion of my interviews with the mayor, that he stated that he had been recording all of our conversations, which was not made known to me in advance. Second chapter of my report. So that's the first one that deals with process. Second chapter deals with good governance and includes sections five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Talks about what does a municipality do? What is good government? What are principle-based functions which impact all municipalities across Alberta, in fact, across Canada? How does a council make decisions? How does a council behave or how should it behave? And how should a council evaluate? Those, that information is included in the front part of the document. So what does a municipality do? Section five of the report, we outlined the purpose, the range of municipal services, how they're delivered, the split of responsibility between policy and operations, and the impact that an election can have on any municipality. Section six, we looked at the base of understanding in terms of how does a council function? How does it become a value added body to the municipality? What are the basic processes and practices of governance? What's the importance with regard to roles and responsibilities, which of course, a lot of what is at the key of this study, the expectations of a council, the requirements of those roles of council, what is meant by good governance practices. And then I also had a chapter on how was this council introduced to its roles, some of which of course are covered as some of you would know in the Municipal Government Act that was made reference to by the Deputy Minister and the Minister Section 153 talks about the roles of councillors. 154 adds on the roles of a, a mayor or chief elected official. And section 201 talks about council roles. And there's lots of material throughout the act that makes reference to what a council may or must do. I also talked in sec chapter seven or section seven on what I call principle-based functions. I said that all members of council should be engaged in the governing process. They should have the equal right to be heard or to feel that they're being heard. They all should have equal access to the mayor, such as there's no inner circle. There's simply a council circle. They should have their views and preferences heard in any discussion of council priorities. They should own the organization structure. That is, they should be part of any decision and motion to approve the top three levels, council and its boards and committees, the CAO, department heads, those three, or particular importance to a council. They should be at the table assessing any shortlisted candidates for the role of a chief administrative officer. They should be there talking to the recruitment firm when a new CAO is being hired. They should be intimately involved in the assessment of a CAO and they should be involved in the review of policies and perhaps any revisions. They should all be fully engaged, equally engaged in reviewing the budget as presented. They should be concurrently involved with regard to agenda items and their disposition. They should have equal and concurrent access to all information that flows into the city that it pertains to a council. They should be equally and concurrently made aware of public input. They should have equal participation in any new initiatives. They should have equal treatment with regard to how do we appoint people to boards and committees. They should, be, they should have the right to be engaged in the review of policies and expectation of new policies. And all of them should be engaged in the review of city county relationships pre authorizing any new approach or any cost or user sharing agreements, including facility development. All of Council are elected equally all of Council should be involved and at the table. 
Section two talked in, in chapter eight about how does council decide, and I talked about council committees. We talked about the role and impact of what are called ABCs, agencies, boards, committees, and I also made reference to the public's impact on council governance. Chapter section nine talked about how council behaves, and that speaks more specifically to the code of conduct, which is section 146.1 of the act, which talks about the fact uh, that every council in Alberta is required to have a code of conduct and it sets out the principles, talks about uh, communications, talks about relationships to each other, talks about pecuniary interest, talks about the role in use and disclosure of information and so on. It's covered in the report. Section two also talked about how a council evaluates, uh, which they talk about around what's the orientation to a council, what does role clarity really mean in terms of the role of the mayor, the role of the CAO, the role of councillors, we talk about the procedural bylaw in terms of how meetings are to be run. We talk about how council should set priorities as a body on the advice of its administration, the input of the public. We talked about the impact of agencies and boards, and we talked about the interface, which should be there between a council and the administration. Chapter three talks about good management. We talk in sections 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 about what senior management, what are the impact in the organization? What are the legislated roles of a chief administrative officer referred to as a CAO? Talks about what constitutes good solid municipal management. Talks about why role separation, the role between council as the elected body, administration as the administrators, why that separation is fundamental and important. And talks about if all things are working relatively as they should, what results should be expected. Section 11 talks about what the administration impacts, which is the preparation and guidance that council members receive as they get into office. Talks about how they get advice with regard to resolutions. Uh, the section talks about responses to inquiries made of administration by members of council, who's allowed to ask the questions, whether or not you go through a chain of command and so on. Talks about how guidance to the mayor should be provided so that any new mayor gets good guidance in terms of how to chair a meeting, what kind of questions you might expect at the meeting, what kind of responses, and so on. The administration impacts the background research, the technical matters that council has to run into. The sum of those impacts is significant and ongoing throughout any term of office. Council typically understands that, and council typically understands that they should have a positive mutual respectful relationship with their administration. The basic role of senior management is to guide and direct the employees based on current council policies, bylaws, and what should be considered as quality management, which is not to serve as executive assistance of individual members of council, including the mayor, but rather to serve as policy advisors to the whole council, including the mayor. Section 12, I talk about the establishment of the role of a chief administrative officer, which has become one of the fundamental issues in this particular inspection. Section 205 outlines the fact that every council has to have one, which shouldn't, you shouldn't find all that surprising given that every organization accounts across Canada, and not every, virtually every organization of a public sector nation ha nature has either a chief administrative officer or a chief executive officer. Every council must appoint one or more persons to carry out those powers and duties. If more than one person is appointed, the council must by bylaw set out how that's gonna happen. And council can give the, the position of a CAO any title that the council considers appropriate. And so in some places you hear the term city manager, which I think they do in Calgary, and in other places it's CAO or chief administrative officer. And in the old days, they would have a title called county commissioner or chief, chief commissioner. Section 207 talks about the role of a CAO, talks about the CAOs being the administrative head of the organization, of the municipality. They're to ensure that policies that are approved by council are implemented. They're to advise and inform council on matters of operation and the affairs of the municipality. And they're to perform other duties as assigned. And that's all covered in section 207, 208. And in section 13, I talked about the role of what's good management and what's the role of the CAO with that regard, because we've talked about how important it is. CAO is responsible for all aspects of the administration, for the duty of advising the mayor and the members of council, for ensuring focus on the quality customer service, for supporting and coaching the team members in the organization, for ensuring sound policies are developed, 
to ensure supporting procedures, participating as a member, and the final notice to work collegially with this council. I also talked about why role separation is fundamental. Why do we have a CAO, council members as elected officials? The challenge to management is twofold. To add value to the decision-making through providing first-rate, independent, unvarnished advice. The second is to provide effective and efficient decision-making and direction to subordinate staff to make sure they understand the tasks that they've been assigned and to make sure they've got the support to get on with it. The decisions of a municipality obviously don't impact just one business or one enterprise. They impact virtually the whole community. Ideas come from all of you, from all sectors of the community. Decisions are made, however, by one body that's called council. Management performs best when it's been advised as to the current policies, decisions, and then provided the liberty to manage within those guidelines. Daily interference by council is simply a reflection of a lack of trust and a personal belief that council members were elected to manage, rather than the fact that the council's role is to establish the policies and make corporate policy decisions. So what results are expected? Council is making quality decisions which should impact the whole community. You should get a good, fresh, refreshed suite of policies by a new council, a solid, respectful relationship between members of council and each other, i.e. the mayor and all members of council. You should have a decision-making process that allows the council time to think before it has to act. You should hire a CAO who can manage the administration and act as a fulcrum point between administration and council and therefore advise council. You should have mechanisms which enable the public to comment and to connect on policy. And you should have the intellectual and maturity capacity to accept that there will always be limits and that those limits are not necessarily easily ignored. Section four, our findings. Our findings are based on the combination of what we heard and observed and read and saw and includes all current members of council, former members of council, by the way, very few, current members of management and administration, former members of management and administration, and some members of the public that called or emailed uh, in, as a part of our study. As well, we had responses to our request for documentation from the administration. We looked at what the legislation requires, and we looked at what makes sense in terms of good governance and good management historically. The findings indicated that with regard to the early days of this term of office, that the mayor felt the election had been tilted against him and that he was considered to be the outsider, that there was a pervasive attitude of non-trust in your administration, your management, and evidence was being sought to prove that point. Staff that were not cooperative found themselves soon on the outside looking in. Management, both prior and then, had prepared a comprehensive briefing and orientation process for council. I looked at it, all the basic elements were covered. The mayor felt that his vision was accepted because he won the election. The mayor believed that the city lost 35 to $40 million during the processes of the last council. The mayor did not understand that the, the Municipal Government Act did not confer power on the mayor to act, but rather to lead and to provide advice and guidance and, and to recommend. Uh, the council is chosen by the public, and so there's a degree of tolerance which is expected both by us as well as by the public and by the mayor and council. This council has been split uh, for quite some time, not quite out of the gate, but not long thereafter. It became evident early on not always reflected in the voting record because many of the votes are quite frankly uh, common sense and our housekeeping. Most issues were non-controversial. The mayor's, so on the ones that were controversial, we found a degree of split. And when we talked to councillors individually as well as the mayor, we also heard about the split on council. The mayor's correspondence, in fact, written to us, cites the fact that this council is split and that they were perceived to be a block of three councillors. We also found with regard to the impact of the change in the CAO structure, the new council agreed to replace the single CAO with three. And you chose to develop a new bylaw to bring that about. And you end up with three, three CAOs, one in charge of uh, corporate services, one growth and development, one community operations. The city has struggled to achieve consistency 
Several of those people have passed through those roles at time only one fully in place. Some in roles for a very limited period of time. The mayor expressed advantages to the new structure, which he wrote to me on the 16th of August, as well as the 30th of August, including reducing corruption in the organization. The advertisement reports that the city director reports to the mayor. The structure removes the buffer between the mayor and councillors. As a result, council, in our opinion, is free to direct individual managers and staff no longer have an administrative champion called the, C the CAO. They have three individuals that are all trying to operate three separate divisions. In terms of treatment of, sen of senior management, the change after an election is not surprising. New councils come in, there's sometimes a degree of change. Sometimes in most cases, it's limited to the chief administrative officer. And in many cases across Canada, there's no change. Uh, in some places there is, and in this case there was. What's unique about this is that during the time that we did the review, approximately 60, six zero people left in the space of a year, four retired, 19 left involuntarily, and 13, and I put it in quotations, left voluntarily. We were also advised that the establishment of a strategic advisory group. The concept was introduced by the mayor in October, sorry, in May of last year. It was to be comprised of experts. They would handle issues that were external to the normal bureaucracy. There would be three directors who would be, the three directors would be seen to be too busy to handle those very high level issues. And as a result of that, the strategic advisory group, which was made accountable to the mayor only, and we're expected to pick up those requirements. We were informed that this strategic advisory group, which personally had not studied previously, uh, that it was modeled after two major centers, including the city of Calgary. I checked, I contacted the city manager and his assistant and was advised that that was not so. Our assessment is that you end up with a double bureaucracy and limited accountability. We also looked at council meetings. It was evident that the advisory role of management of those council meetings was very limited. Uh, the meetings tend to ramble to get into all kinds of detail. The length of the meeting was a concern to some members of council and the meetings that we reviewed, which on average across Canada would be sort of two to four hours probably, uh, in this case range from five to 14 hours. The council administrative interface, we were advised that there's significant involvement in administrative matters. So we, we determined that both through documentation as well as interviews. That reflects a misunderstanding of roles and reflects mistrust in the organization and will actually impact the interest of anybody else trying to apply when they find out the degree of involvement that a council wants to have. In terms of strategic priorities, every council is encouraged to set them, to figure out what's important in the community. What do we need to do first? What do we need to tackle? Council sits down typically with its CAO, the department heads, they get together, they discuss, and they come up with a list and council eventually decides what's in the top list of priorities. In this case, the mayor came in and provided a 120 day plan uh, that was endorsed for information initially, which is a motion made in October of 21. And then it was endorsed for action in or October 22, endorsed for action in this past year. The current culture of suspicion and acrimony is not a good base on which to build goals and strategies. In terms of code of conduct, we looked at that because each council, as I said earlier, has a code of conduct. It can and be used as a tool to intimidate others on council. It's effective to the degree that all members are committed to a reasonable treatment of each other. Our findings were that all members had violated section 153D, which says that they're to get, obtain information through the CAO. Individual council members have felt bullied and demeaned by the mayor and others. Management has been treated in a disrespectful manner. Three councillors acted disrespectfully to the others by publishing an article in the local paper. One councillor publicly derided staff at a conference of other elected and, and appointed officials. And we had a councillor directing who should be terminated next in the organization. The mayor violated the code as a result of bypassing section 153D that I talked about earlier by having private discussions on council topics with certain members, by lobbying only certain members of council on issues rather than the whole council, by bullying one or more members of council, by showing total disrespect by all members, 
or tolerating rather, and by not acting appropriately with members of a community group. The mayor also violated the code in my opinion and my findings, misled council as to the hiring of an investigator, uh, which as he quoted was as per Minister McIver's advice. And of course we investigated that and found out that that was not true. Not ensuring concurrent access to information, i.e. so that everyone had equal access. The mayor violated the code by directing that certain property be sold without a resolution of council, that management employees that were directed to be fired, that there were derogatory comments directed toward members of staff, and by directing staff to ignore their own social media policy. With regard to council's decision-making processes, council was advised by their own city administration during the orientation process, by me during the orientation process, with respect to the structure and to one employee. And as a note, uh, there was no pushback on that. Council resolution or a bylaw was needed to move the needle. If you want action in the municipality, council has to vote in order for action to happen, has to be a majority decision. Decision making otherwise is through the office of the CAOs. The mayor should be accompanied by a CAO to any important meetings where some form of movement toward a decision was the goal. So if you're negotiating on land, negotiating on a new structure, negotiating on a new agreement, you would have the CAO and or other senior members of administration with you in part for preservation and protection and in part to make sure that you're not making promises uh, that you can't afford to make. Council decision-making processes. Elections are not about picking managers. Elections are about picking public servants. The legislative services within this organization is critically important. Those are the folks that record what happens at a meeting. The minutes are absolutely sacrosanct. They need to be recorded carefully and appropriately and within the rules. They need to reflect what actually happened at the meeting. They should be immediately available in some places immediately available in other places within 24 to 48 hours and certainly by time for the next meeting. Procedural or non-controversial motions are often unanimous and that's the case in most places across Canada. Lengthy meetings are often a reflection of process and or quality of advice and to some extent whether or not the issue is large and significant. Departmental issues, we found a significant if not unprecedented turnover in employees. Chosen senior managers by this council have all been replaced. The impact on community service will still be felt as you go into this year 2023. The impact on community service will be felt. Community council is restricted to the employment of the CAO only, in this case, the three CAOs. Departed management expressed to the inspector that they were pressured to resign or to be released and perceived disloyalty that was listed as a cause. With regard to audit services, which is sex, or chapter 18, section four, auditor selection process was carried out by the council's audit committee. The 2021 audit had not been completed during our inspection, which is recorded in my report, I think on page 178. 2020 audit was reported as clean with no difficulties with management. There were no material misstatements reported. Four recommendations were made for improvement. The 2021 financial statements reported as late after, were reported late after the May 1st deadline and reported as late because of staff turnover. Council expressed concern with the quarterly update format, the presentation during a council budget meeting. With regard to the budget section or chapter 19, a review of the 2022 budget approval process identified that staff again followed the previous council's guidelines, which they should, with regard to the development of the 2022 operating and capital budgets and a four-year plan. The budget was presented to council December the 7th and included the 2022 operating and capital budget 2326 capital plan. At the December 7th council meeting, council did not approve the budget, but rather the acceptance of the plan and the capital plan as information. And following that meeting on December the 10th of 2021, the chief financial officer, the CFO, left your organization. Chapter 20, with regard to financial status, the good news is that Chestermere is ranked second lowest in property taxes on an average $514,760, which is a median assessed home. Both reserves per capita and as a percentage of revenue show the city in a positive light with almost double the level of reserves in comparison to other municipalities. City's debt limit was at 27% of the provincial debt limit or mid range of the comparables that we looked at. 
It should be noted that the charts do not include the city's utility corporation debt of over 31 million. Operating expenses per capita have risen over the period of time, which is quite normal, 8.2% uh, from 2018 to 2020. Operating expenses per capita were 1640, which compares favorably with those in the same range. In terms of conclusions, chapter five or section five of the report. In conclusions, we found that we found a mayor who felt that he was lied to, misled by former city leadership. Mayor who believed that significant change would have to be made if he was gonna be a successful leader. This would need to include as a priority the removal of the then CAO. A mayor who appeared to recognize that the legislation was an impediment to his plan to make fundamental changes who understood that obstacles could be removed if he could develop and maintain a sufficient number of close supporters on council. A council when they were elected were not clear what the priorities were, what needed to be done to fix any perceived shortcomings. And a mayor who saw his role as presenting his plan and expecting support. We found several members of council supported the mayor in his desire to weed out what they saw as underperformers, obstacles to the progress that they had in mind for their city. We had members of council who soon recognized signs of a split with regard to the perceived independence of the mayor, as well as their desire to protect seasoned and formerly trusted employees. The council which went along, along with the mayor's desire to remake the structure by accepting this novel three CAO model, which the mayor believed would be at least a step in eliminating the gatekeeper role played by a traditional CAO. A council had very little impact of the full impact of dropping a single strong CAO model. A council who struggled early on to bring in this new model quickly understood that those that they felt were suitable either realized themselves that they weren't a good fit or who council and the mayor decided to sideline in favor of bringing on new people with presumably better credentials or more applicable credentials. We found a council which seems not to understand that it's the governing body, not a quasi administrative structure vested with management responsibilities who ought to be involved in the hiring of senior management. We found the perception or belief by three councillors that the mayor and the other three are privy to information before the rest of council. We found a heightened level of distrust as information by the three was circulated to the minister's office. We found a mayor who preferred to function often without managerial assistance when he was pursuing deals with those in the city and beyond. We were advised of numerous managers and staff exiting the city organization as a result of being identified as non-supporters of the mayor or council's new agenda, or at least were uncomfortable with this rather abrupt change in governing style. We found a decision-making style which without a committee of the whole has resulted in lengthy council meetings as council discussed the issues brand new discuss potential consequences and legality, and then make decisions all at the same meeting in many cases, of an assertive and creative council facing limited pushback by senior management, and as a result inserting themselves into the normal realm of management functions. We were advised of a considerably reduced management body, i.e. no CAO, no CFO, with lessened municipal senior management experience who appear ready in quotation marks to welcome councillors into their domain. We found an organization which will undoubtedly find its footing because that's what quality people eventually do and changes will be absorbed. We hope that new and hopefully experienced local government management will gradually arise, take on senior roles. We, we hope and pray that council may begin to understand its potential as a collective body, as opposed to individual players focused on their own agendas. Move to chapter six or section six, which are the recommendations. You might've thought I'd never get there and that's chapter 22 of the report. We recommend that Alberta Municipal Affairs present the final report of the inspection to the mayor and councillors for their review and comment. Uh, we presented a draft report as the mayor, in, as the uh, deputy minister indicated, I think on November 2nd, uh, and a virtual presentation. And we've also subsequently presented them at the final report. Sec chapter recommendation two, with regard to the conduct of the mayor and council, we recommend that this council review each of the findings in the report, which point to statements and actions that we've cited as meeting the description of irregular, improper and improvident conduct, and those which we have found 
to have violated various sections of the code of conduct of the city. Subsection one, that the mayor and each member of council be mindful of what they say about current and expected level of behavior, expected of a mature functional council. Subsection two, that they seek legal advice as to the establishment of an integrity commissioner for the city to deal with any future charges related to council behavior. We also recommend that the experienced legal counsel or a code of conduct investigator be return, retained by council to assess this process as currently stated, particularly with respect to the merit as your gatekeeper and recommend changes that might be applicable. We recommend council agree to a one day in-depth refresher by a recognized expert on all aspects of the code of conduct. We recommend that council request its administration to bring forward a council administrative protocols which would guide relationships between all council members, senior management and staff. With regard to the governance and management model, we recommend council provide the public an opportunity to offer their comments to this report. We recommend council review and adjust its governance model to include a process such as a committee of the whole, which is designed to allow all members of council to discuss proposed changes as to how the city functions before the changes are made. Such committee meetings need to be held within five to seven days prior to a regular meeting of council. Subsection C, we recommend council reconsider its support for the three CAO model in light of this report and reinstate a single CAO model that they engage a recruitment firm with municipal that they engage a recruitment firm with municipal CAO recruitment clientele to identify appropriately qualified candidates that the firm identify the top three to five candidates council conduct the interviews with the guidance of a recruitment specialist who will also provide council guidance as to the contract compensation benefits severance and so on with regard to council relationships we recommend council seek the assistance of an experienced municipal relationship advisor to hopefully rebuild relationships between the mayor and all councillors this goal will not be quickly realized and may require ongoing monitoring and support with regard to roles we recommend the mayor and council agree to adopt a revised role statement for the position of mayor and councillor those statements should align with section 153 of the act and other generally accepted local government practices with regard to strategic planning we recommend council engage an independent experienced local government advisor to assist this council to develop its own priorities for the remainder of this term with regard to policy development, we recommend council or a committee thereof be required to review your current city policies and protocols within 90 days in order to better establish a solid base of government on a go forward basis. We recommend council provide to the public its rationale for making changes to meeting procedures, such as the public question period and determine if there are any reasonable alternatives to this mechanism based on any decision to remove it from the agenda. With regard to council procedures, we recommend council engage an independent review of its bylaw, adopt an agendas committee with clear terms of reference to ensure that council guides the agenda issues which are to be identified in process. We recommend that the mayor, the deputy mayor, together with the CAO and head of legislative services be appointed to the committee. With regard to the mayor, we recommend that the mayor be required to, number one, seek the prior approval of council by resolution for any new initiative he'd like to pursue with respect to any city business, recreation, cultural, or not-for-profit entity or other matter not covered by current policy. We, <laughs> we recommend that the mayor ensure that he engage with all members of his council on any proposed new initiative or policy change. We recommend that the mayor ensure he's accompanied by one member of council, the deputy mayor or else a councillor selected on a rotational basis together with the CAO or their, or their designate to meet with any group or entity or, or officials of other levels of government or its regional neighbor. We recommend that the mayor report to council in a written report on any such meetings at the, on a next meeting basis. We recommend that the mayor be required to accept the fact that he does not have the authority to act in a unilateral or administrative fashion in any circumstance. <laughs> For example, with regard to any hiring, interviewing, releasing, managing people, we recommend that the mayor agree in an open letter to the community that he has reviewed and accepted his requirements and expectations as mayor to develop a broader 
inclusive leadership style, which ensures his colleagues are informed, updated on a concurrent basis, that he will seek the necessary administrative advice of the CAO, the counsel of his colleagues before making statements of commitment on behalf of the city, and that he accepts the principles and advice of the report for, as an opportunity to learn and to do a reset for the remainder of this term. With regard to the deputy mayor, we recommend council adopt this policy, its earlier decision to rotate the position of deputy mayor amongst all members of council. This is said with no respect, no disrespect to the current incumbent. It's such that those who have yet to be appointed will have an approximately equal time in this role by the end of this term. Any member of council has the choice, of course, to opt out of their term. With regard to the strategic advisory committee, we recommend that the designated officers bylaw with respect to the SAG or strategic advisory committee be rescinded immediately and that full administrative authority to assist and advise council be restored to the city administration. The CAO administration will have the latitude to engage external advisors within budgets that are approved annually or on an as needed basis. With regard to legislative services, we recommend that a director of ledge services be recruited to guide the management of council Council committee meetings, including preparation of agendas, rigorous development, prompt publication of minutes, proper management of public hearings, and so on. We recommend that the business items on a council agenda be presented utilizing what's called an RFD, a request for decision, to ensure and encourage improved minute taking, a clear understanding as to the intent of every resolution. With regard to finance and audit, we recommend that management advise council on an appropriate process for the recruitment of an audit firm given that the audit term of five years has expired. We recommend that the city take the necessary steps to ensure that it adheres to the legislative requirements for filing financial statements and quarterly updates. We recommend with regard to follow-up, the council be required to retain an experienced municipal consultant to conduct a post audit within six months of the inspection to determine if sufficient steps have been taken, which will ensure that the mayor and councillors are adequately positioned for a reasonable level of collegiality, common courtesy. If the findings of such an audit is that there have been very limited progress, inadequate evidence to find ways to collaborate in a respectful manner, that the consultant has the authority to recommend to the minister that a further inspection be conducted with all options and sanctions fully on the table or fully available. In terms of follow-up, we recommend the mayor take concrete steps to restore a level of respect and trust between all members of council. It's not to suggest that all members of council are expected to vote as one voice on all council decisions, but rather that the mayor and councillors are expected to find ways to act in a more respectful manner, regardless of their individual differences. With regard to the official administrator, of which much has been said, we recommend that the minister continue to appoint, or in this case, appoint an official administrator, which is covered in section 575 of the act for a period not to exceed six months to oversee the implementation of these recommendations, to assess and comment on the efficacy of all related council decisions, the powers of the of section 575 will apply. And inspection findings, we recommend that the minister approve the findings, recommendations of the report, and share it for action with the council of the city of Chestermere. And for my position at sake, I wanna say thank you to the minister and assistant deputy and deputy minister uh, for appointing me to the task, I think, and I appreciate your patience with this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cuff. Now I will turn things over to the Honorable Rebecca Schulz, who was sworn in as Minister of Municipal Affairs in October of 2022. Since then, Minister Schulz has been very involved with the Chestermere inspection, and she has some insights and next steps to share with us here this evening. Minister Schulz. Thank you very much, Jordan. Good evening, everybody. I want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to join us here tonight. As Jordan mentioned, I'm Rebecca Schultz, and it has been my honor to serve as the Minister of Municipal Affairs since last October. Since then, and during my time as Minister of Children's Services since May of 2019, I have spent a lot of time traveling across Alberta, meeting folks where they live, at the doorstep, and in community gathering spaces just like this one. I can tell you that the circumstances of our meeting here tonight 
are unique in my experience, but one thing remains similar to every public gathering I have attended, and that is a common desire for competent, effective government at all levels that respects local citizens. These simple basic principles of good governance and administration are things we all want, and what's more, we deserve them. Good governance starts and ends with democracy, and there are two things that I want to say about that. The first is that the citizens of Chestermere cast their ballots in a free and fair municipal election in October of 2021, and all members of Chestermere City Council were duly elected as leaders of your community. The second is that Alberta's government respects the autonomy of local electors to choose the people they want to represent them on their municipal governing council, and we do not intervene lightly in municipal affairs. As Brandy explained earlier, while municipal affairs does have oversight of all 332 municipalities in Alberta, we must always be respectful of local autonomy and intervene only in extraordinary circumstances. But let me be clear. When we must intervene, we will. Unfortunately, there are circumstances in which provincial intervention in the form of an inspection is warranted, as is the case with Chestermere. I am here tonight to tell you that having considered the inspection report and all the responses provided by council and senior administration, I consider that the city of Chestermere is managed in an irregular, improper, and improvident manner. A series of formal directives is necessary to restore good governance. But just before I tell you about the directives I am issuing, I want to tackle one specific issue right here and now. I have heard various allegations about the integrity of the inspection process and the integrity of the people who have been involved in this inspection. I want to be very clear to all of you in this room and everyone who may be listening in through the live stream tonight. This inspection has been conducted properly and fairly by people of excellent character and impeccable credentials. I have reviewed the inspection report carefully multiple times. I have reviewed the submissions from Chestermere Council members and administration multiple times. I have also considered the information shared with me by Council and administration at the February 8th in-person meeting. The work of the independent inspector and of the government officials involved with the Chestermere inspection has been exemplary. These are all qualified professionals who are dedicated to public service and entirely disinterested in the local politics of Chestermere. They share one common goal, and that is to see good governance in place for the residents of Chestermere. They have done their jobs. The inspection process has worked as it should. It has been fair and balanced, and I have faith in the validity of the report findings. Now, moving to the directives I have issued to the City of Chestermere. These directives are based on the events that occurred in the time between Chestermere's municipal election in October 2021 and September 2022, when the inspection report was submitted. These directives are corrective in nature, intended to return Chestermere to good governance by addressing the key concerns identified in the inspection report. If the city implements these directives as they are required to, Chestermere will be in a better position to return to effective decision making. My hope is to see a respectful and collaborative council with open and transparent processes that align with legislative requirements. In total, I have issued 12 formal directives. Chestermere Council and administration must comply with these directives. So let me walk through each directive in turn. Directive one, council and the chief administrative officers must review all recommendations made to the city in the inspection report and provide a report to me on the city's plan to address each recommendation or an explanation on why no action will be taken for any recommendation. This report must be discussed in an open session of Council, approved by Council resolution and delivered to the Minister by no later than June 30th of this year. This directive ensures that Council takes the inspection report seriously and openly discusses that report to determine how to respond to each of the inspector's recommendations. Directive 2. 
For immediate action, the chief administrative officers are directed to provide printed copies of the inspection report to the public upon request subject to the city's fees for photocopying. The report must also be made available on the city's website until all directives have been met to my satisfaction. This directive is designed to ensure public transparency by making the inspection report available to all residents of Chestermere. I would also note that the report will be posted online at the Government of Alberta's website as well. Directive 3. I direct Council to review its current procedural bylaw and determine what changes, if any, are warranted based on the findings of the inspection report. This review must specifically take into consideration the rotation of Deputy Mayor, protocols for Council meeting agenda, development and use of requests for decisions, ensuring equal and concurrent access to information for all members of Council, protocols for posting Council meeting minutes and live recordings on the Municipal website, and Council roles and responsibilities. As part of this directive, Council and the Chief Administrative Officers must provide me with an action plan discussed in open session and approved by Council resolution on the City's implementation of any changes to the procedural bylaw or an explanation as to why no actions will be taken. This review must be completed by no later than August 31st and the action plan submitted by September 30th. I made Directive 3 after considering comments and recommendations in the inspection report related to Council procedures. By clarifying and correcting any issues with Council procedures, this Council can ensure that all members have equal access to information and equal participation in Council initiatives. Directive 4. By no later than July 31st, Chestermere Council must engage in an experienced and independent third party municipal consultant to review and provide advice on the effectiveness of the current CAO structure and the strategic advisory group as outlined in the designated officer bylaw. The city must provide the minister with the municipal consultants advice by no later than August 31st. As part of this directive, the city must provide an action plan discussed in an open session council and approved by council resolution on the implementation of any recommendations provided or a rationale if no actions are taken. This is also due by October 31st, or by August 31st. There are 332 municipalities in Alberta. All but Chestermere employ a one CAO model. This model is so widely used primarily because it promotes an operational environment where one individual is ultimately responsible for the city administration. This, is, this not only provides clarity and accountability for council, it also helps to minimize the risk of council becoming directly involved in administrative matters. While the Municipal Government Act allows for more than one CAO to be appointed, I am ultimately concerned with the effectiveness of the three CAO model employed by Chestermere in light of the inspection report's findings. This directive also concerns the strategic advisory group established by Council and the concerns raised about the resulting blurred lines of roles and accountability between staff, Council, and electors. Directive 5. I require the chief administrative officers to provide me with a report listing all code of conduct complaints, both formal and informal, since October 21st, 2021. This report must include any records and or documents that detail the description of any complaints, the record of decisions for determining the validity of any complaints, as well as descriptions of how each complaint was addressed and or investigated. This report must be submitted by June 30th. Furthermore, Council must repeal and replace or amend the Code of Conduct bylaw to remove all provisions authorizing Council to undertake preliminary reviews of Code of Conduct complaints. This must be completed by July 31st. Council must also appoint an independent third party by Council resolution to handle all complaints, including receiving and conducting preliminary reviews, documenting, investigating, and presenting the findings, and recommending appropriate sanctions to Council for consideration. The procurement of the third party must be done through a competitive procurement process, and the candidate in question must demonstrate municipal experience and not be a current employee or contractor of the city.
The identity of the person appointed must be disclosed to my office by September 29th and on an ongoing basis if any personnel changes are made. Until such an individual is appointed and I have been informed of that appointment in writing, the council is directed to undertake no investigations under the code of conduct bylaw. The name of the independent third party must be published on the municipal website once their identity has been disclosed to me. Given the findings of the inspection report, I feel these are necessary measures to ensure that the code of conduct is not misused and that all Chestermere residents, as well as all members of council and administration, can feel confidence in the thoroughness and fairness of the process. Directive six. By November 30th, Council must engage an experienced and independent third party consultant to provide advice and guidance in the development of protocols to address conflict within Council and promote collaborative governance. This consultant must have no current affiliation with the City as either an employee or contractor. All members of Council must participate in the development and adoption of these protocols, which must be completed by January 31st of next year. This directive is intended to address the many documented instances of interpersonal conflict between council members, which has negatively affected the council's ability to govern the city effectively. Directives seven through nine, which I will outline next, address some related concerns. First are the concerns raised in the inspection that council may have taken actions prior to the formal approval of council by resolution. Failure to adhere to the required processes ultimately reduces transparency and accountability to the public and exposes the municipality to liability and legal challenges. Secondly, members of Council may not fully understand or appreciate the distinction between the roles and responsibilities of Council and those of administration. Therefore, Directive 7 requires Council to develop and complete a comprehensive strategic plan to guide the direction of the municipality, including any tasks to be performed by councillors. This plan must be developed through one or more strategic planning sessions and must include opportunities for input and participation from every Council member, as well as members of the public. This strategic plan must be completed by no later than October 31st. For Directive 8, all members of Council must discontinue exercising a power or function or performing any duties that are assigned to the Chief Administrative Officer as outlined in Section 201 of the Municipal Government Act. Furthermore, by September 30th, all members of Council must attend a Roles and Responsibilities Workshop conducted by Municipal Affairs staff. Directive 9. I direct Council to act only by resolution or bylaw in accordance with Section 181 of the Municipal Government Act. I will note that these are basic expectations of any Council in any Alberta municipality. However, the inspection report has identified areas of concern here, and as a result, I feel it is necessary to issue this directive to very clearly remind Council of this requirement. Directive 10, Council must work with administration to hire an audit firm by using a competitive procurement process by no later than June 30th. Additionally, Council and administration must develop and submit to me a timeline and implementation plan for completing and reporting the audited financial statements for 2021 and the upcoming audited financial statements for 2022. My office must receive the timeline and implementation plan by no later than April 30th. This directive is intended to ensure Chestermere Council complies with its legislative requirement to ensure annual audited financial statements have been prepared, accepted, and submitted to my department for each calendar year. More importantly, accurate and timely financial information is critical to inform responsible Council decisions and it is also critical to ensure public transparency. Directive 11, the Chief Administrative Officers must provide me with a list of all municipal land sales since October 2021. This list must include, this list must also include the following. 
the market values for each parcel of land, the date when the market value was determined, copies of the associated advertisements, which must include the date and method of advertising, copies of associated council resolutions, the sale price of each parcel of land, any rationale for selling land below market value, if applicable, date of the sale, identity of the purchaser, and any other related information. This list must be provided by no later than July 31st. The inspection report has raised questions about whether legislative processes have been properly followed in the sale of municipal lands in Chestermere. This directive will help ensure there are answers to those questions. Finally, to ensure these directives are taken seriously and acted upon in a timely way, Directive 12 requires that by the 20th of every second month going forward, Council and Chief Administrative Officers must prepare and provide me with a report that summarizes Council's progress on these directives. This reporting must continue until such time that all directives have been completed to my satisfaction. The bi-monthly report shall also include all approved council meeting agendas and approved signed council meeting minutes for the relevant two month period. These reports must also be made publicly available by posting them on the city website within seven days of submitting them to me. So those are the directives that I have issued as a result of the inspection report. I shared these directives and my reasons for them with all members of Chestermere City Council and senior administration this evening just before we gathered here tonight. The directives will be posted on the Government of Alberta's website along with supporting materials and the inspection report itself. We've got hard copies of the directives to share with folks who are attending this public information session in person, along with some other background information. All of the information we have shared here tonight will be available on the government's website. Municipal Affairs will continue working closely with the City of Chestermere to monitor the city's progress in meeting these directives. And to ensure that the needed progress takes place, I will be appointing an official administrator to supervise council at least until the end of the 2023 calendar year. This appointment may be... This appointment may be extended further if required. You may be aware that an official administrator has been in place since last fall. Based on the inspection report, I have advised Council that an official administrator will be in place until the end of this year at minimum. I will also be reviewing the terms of the official administrator's appointment and making any necessary changes to ensure that the role remains effective in its supervision of the municipality. As my deputy minister outlined earlier this evening, if the directives are not fulfilled to my satisfaction, I will take appropriate next steps as required. And again, as my deputy uh, minister mentioned, those steps can, if necessary, include the dismissal of members of council and or the CAOs. It is my hope and expectation that it will not come to that. As we have said several times this evening, our goal is to help Chestermere deliver appropriate governance for its residents, and our pursuit of that goal continues. But let's be clear, these directives are basic expectations that any citizen should have of any municipality in Alberta. I and my staff are committed to procedural fairness and have been throughout this entire inspection process, and the directives I have issued are entirely fair and reasonable. I fully acknowledge that many of the city council members had been elected for the first time. They were new to the business of municipal governance when the problem started. But at the same time, the problems have been going on for 18 months now, and enough is enough. We need to address them. <laughs> These directives will help to ensure the problems are addressed. I see no valid reason why Chestermere City Council and administration cannot or should not meet the requirements set out in these directives. It is my sincere hope and expectation that they will. 
Thank you all for attending tonight's session and for being engaged in the leadership of the Chestermere community. I look forward to your questions. Well, there you have it, 12 directives from the minister based on the results of the municipal inspection. I know this is a lot of information to take in all at once, which is why we have some people circulating through the room with some handouts for everyone that lists the minister's directives and summarize the findings of the inspection report. I'll also add, if you're exiting the room now, please make sure that you're a little bit quiet so that we continue this meeting's evening in, uh, in a good format. For those listening at home, I can tell you that all the information the minister mentioned is now available online or will be very shortly at alberta.ca slash Chestermere. I will now open the floor to questions. Note that this is not a venue for people to make political points or comment on the validity of the process, the report, or its findings. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a staff member will come to you. They will hold the microphone for you and will not be releasing the microphone to you. I would ask that you state your name and forgo any preamble and just ask clear, straightforward questions about the information that was shared with you tonight. I promise that I will do my best to ensure that everyone who has a question gets the opportunity to ask it and receive a fair answer. Again, we're aiming for an 8 p.m. stop time, which is about 40 minutes from now. And if we don't get to all of your questions tonight, you'll be able to email, email your question to Alberta Municipal Affairs and they will respond. We will start with questions in the room and then go to the live stream for those attending from home. Darren, we'll go with your question first, please. Um, I'm a, a fairly new resident here. I came here about three and a half years ago because of the wonderful uh, place it is. Uh, I am concerned uh, about there is no no consideration or or or, or um, direction as to w how we address 60 people who worked for this community and who were expecting to be treated uh, fairly and were caught up in this firestorm and uh, how how do we address that and who addresses that and is is that some have some uh, concern for the minister and, and her office. We'll go to Mr. Cuff for that question. Uh, it's legitimate for any municipality through its structure to decide who's an employee and who isn't. It's legitimate for the chief officer to decide who they retain as their direct reports, and that tumbles down the organization to the point where it says uh, you have to go further up to get approval for that decision making. Typically, decisions made with regard to the hiring, release, severance, compensation of personnel are made by department heads on the approval of the chief administrative officer, the overall structure of compensation is approved by the council. In terms of the employees that were released, my understanding based on the information that we had is that employees were provided with uh, a, uh, some degree of legal separation. If that was the case for those that were separated, they were provided with information in terms of what they would receive. And they were provided with uh, essentially a non-disclosure agreement uh, that would limit them for commenting in terms of uh, how they were dismissed and whether or not that was legitimate. So you've got 60 and more people that were that left the organization. The question is, uh, will those roles be, be placed? I have no understanding of that whatsoever. That's up to this council, this uh, CA, three CAOs to determine what's required and what isn't. In terms of the ones that were left, they would have had all legal recourse in terms of launching any lawsuit against the city if they desired, if they felt that they had been treated fairly, if not favorably, uh, then they could have settled with the city and that would be the end of it. So my understanding is that unless people come forward and say they want to sue the city based on unfavorable treatment, uh, the treatment that they receive would deem to be uh, adequate. Whether or not it's reasonable, whether or not it's something that individuals in the audience would support, the, the individuals themselves would have to decide, was I treated fairly, uh, adequately, and therefore am I going to launch any appeal or not? And I can't speak for any of those individuals.
Next question, please. Hi, my name is uh, my name is Alan Malad. I'm a 30-year resident. I have one concern. We're going to have a supervisor, which I really like. Is that supervisor going to be in camera um, on these meetings, or is this going to be private? Good evening. Thanks very much. Just for those who don't know, my name is Gary Sandberg. I'm the Assistant Deputy Minister for Municipal Services. Um, it's a very good question, sir. Uh, we have had, I know, a number of uh, letters from residents who've questioned whether the current setup has, compl has worked completely as it was intended. So we are actually in the process of, as a minister referenced this in her remarks, scoping out what that needs to look like going forward. And it is the intention that the official administrator will have a more visible role on site. Not, not, not every day, but. I'll ask once again, do you have a question? Hi, Stu Hutchison, been here almost as long as Al, but not quite. Um, I appreciate the the comments made by our uh, Rebecca Schultz, our, our minister, and reflecting on those, uh, there seems to be a lack of, of trust, not to her, but within this room and our current administration and perhaps some of council. Not all, but just some. So I'm gonna refer to some of the findings of uh, Mr. Cuff and uh, he said that he stayed, there's a definite split in council. He found there's a definite split. And it sounded to me, and it's obvious to everybody in this room, it, it was a four to three split. So I'm wondering with this uh, administrator being appointed by municipal affairs, if they can ensure, and according to Brandy Cox, the deputy minister, the municipal affairs you're blocking my view. <laughs> Municipal Affairs can give, thank you, directive to the municipality on how they carry out their meetings. Not entirely, but recommendations. And we don't have any history we can review here on how this alleged block, alleged slate, how it happened, who they are. So I would like to see Municipal Affairs get this uh, appointed administrator from municipal affairs to request, because only a member of council, is my understanding, could request a recorded vote. So I think, <clears throat> again, going back to some element of mistrust, that every motion of council, and it's only a couple of pen strokes to do it, every one of them be recorded, so we have a history on which four voted which way and which three voted the other way, and I think they're the same all the time. So a uh, little bit of history here. Back in 2011, an individual run for mayor here unsuccessfully and was running a slate, a slate of four people. If four people are successful out of seven, they control everything, and I'm afraid that's what we have today. That's exactly what we have. So luckily, they weren't successful then. One election went by, and then we had another one. Oh, the first slate was not successful. Only one member got in. I think the one member was like a deer in the headlights, like, what the hell am I going to do now? So that member resigned, said, I don't think I can do this. I thought I could do it from home or by phone, whatever. I don't want to take the position. So municipal affairs did step in and say, we'll have to have a by-election. And it costs that by-election be up to $10,000. So the individual said they would pay it. And they did, and we had a by-election. So there was no slate. Unfortunately today, now, it appears we have that slate. And that is not democracy. That is not why any of us are here. And, and I really thank you folks for stepping in. I appreciate your report. 
Thank you for the time. Sorry, do you have a question, sir? Does anybody want to respond? I appreciate, I, I think many of those were comments, uh, maybe not a specific question, but I appreciate where you're coming from. Um, and so I would just say that within the directives, uh, the City Council has been directed to look at their procedural bylaw to address exactly the things that you've raised. Um, we've also directed that there are open council meetings um, that council must undertake strategic planning and roles and responsibilities training. So this combination of directives, uh, I think essentially was exactly uh, requested, directed of city council to address those issues that you've raised. And um, Deputy Cox, is there anything else you would wanna add? Uh, the deputy minister deferred to me. I, um, you know, the, the, one of the core issues that Chestermere faces, quite simply, is that for whatever number of reasons, the the split evolved in this council, and has done nothing but get further entrenched. And uh, I think you know that uh, this community, this city, this lovely city, deserves a council of seven that are all participating equally at the table. That all that all have the, that all have the same access to information, and at the end of the day, can vote as they wish. And if the count is four three or five two or six one, that's called democracy. What is not democratic, in my view, is having a pre-baked four three decision. The next question, please. Hi, my name is Carl Rideout. Um, I, I'm kind of just wondering, like, the writing's on the wall here, okay? I, I, you, you know, we, we don't need to kick the can down the road uh, for another six months or so. Um, you know, it's very evident with George's findings. I mean, matter of fact, he missed one, which was get rid of the guy. I mean, you know, <laughs> what, 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 sex, you know, in George's recommendations, he missed it. It should be number 18, which is kind of Sorry, moved the sir, guy out. I'll get you to ask your question specifically. Please. Can Thank we you. move him out now? Thank you. I'll go to the uh, minister. There's a bit of a height difference between us, so sorry about that. Uh, so I do understand, uh, as does my ministry, the frustration that many many residents uh, feel or may feel with this process and with the directives. However, there is legislation that governs the process for this type of inspection. It was just updated a couple of years ago. Uh, and so it, it balances the fact that we have to respect the results of uh, the last election and the autonomy uh, and local, local authority of your council. Now, the bar to remove a city council is high, and it ought to be because that was a democratic election process. And so we do respect that. Um, the minister does not just have the ability uh, to dismiss any councillor uh, for any reason, uh, as he or she may see fit. Uh, however, we're following the process uh, through, this through this inspection. Um, now, if the directives that were issued uh, and the dates that accompany those directives are not followed and met, um, then uh, we, we obviously have a little bit of, of flexibility in those. We want to work with council uh, to provide good governance to the residents of Chestermere. You all deserve that. Um, but if the directives are not met to my satisfaction, then additional steps will be taken. Thank you. Next question, please. My name is Ray Blanchard. I moved here in 1968. I bought 20 acres of land. I wanted to start a tree farm. They allowed people to have permits to start tree farms on 20 acres. Then they rescinded the purpose. Then they rescinded the, the, the law. 
Well, what happened to me is I decided to make an environmental park on the place and I spread the trees all over. It's three quarters of a mile long. It has about 350 trees, full size, higher than the ceiling right now. And it was flooded out and some of the trees were dead. It was flooded out because the city had no place to put storm water and they put it in the pond next to me. The water went through the water table and started to kill the trees with alkali. I was ready to take the city to court. I, I filed to go to court and I decided that since I wanted it to be a park and I could turn it over to the city, that that park would be paid for the damages. So far, after over a year, I haven't received any damages. I do have an option of going back to court. Now, do I go back to court by with the laws that you just described, or do I go back by the laws by reinstate my old case in court? That's the question. I believe this may be the wrong forum for that question. However, I think the deputy minister might want to respond. Yeah, thank you. Um, and for what you've described as a, a challenging situation for sure, for sure, but um, certainly outside the scope of what we're talking about today and even um, outside of the scope of our ministry in municipal affairs um, in general. And so uh, certainly um, that that is something that you would want to maybe talk with, you know, your own legal counsel about, but it's not something that we're able to provide advice on tonight, I'm sorry to say. Possibly you, I, I can't, I, I can't say. Um, this is really about uh, the inspection that was conducted by the inspector that we appointed in municipal affairs, um, the findings that uh, Mr. Cuff uh, observed uh, and recommendations in his report, and then the directives that the minister has issued with respect to the council and administration, again, to provide overall good governance and service of the citizens of this community please. Um, my name is Sam. I'm a seven-year resident uh, here in Chestermere, and I have a question regarding our current CAO. Um, how appropriate is it to have a current CAO in office that is facing an assault charge, and what message does it send? So that um, is certainly uh, not something that uh, you know we would uh, be discussing um, tonight. Uh, the inspection process and the directives do talk uh, about the need to look at the three CAO model uh, as it is unique, as you heard, um, to this municipality. And uh, I think Mr. Cuff has talked a bit about some of the challenges um, that he has found with that particular model, and so asking uh, council to uh, take some consideration of whether or not that model is effective but that is not specific to any one cao or sort of making judgment on um, their uh, competence or capacity and uh, the type of situation that you've described um, is certainly challenging but uh, those are allegations they're not convictions and are not part of the discussion today Thank you. We do have an online question. Check, check. Uh, so I have an anonymous question from online uh, that goes, Mr. Cuff referenced in his presentation that the inspection did not include Chestermere utilities or employee payouts. Uh, are these being investigated further? And if so, how? Deputy Minister. Um, those, those are not uh, part of the uh, scope of this, this process. Thank you. A question from the front, I believe, over here. And I'll remind you to please keep your question concise and to the subject at hand. Thank you. We don't talk much. But anyway, my question to the minister and her group is, what are we going to do with the disinformation that's going to hit tomorrow? It's been happening for six months, the same thing, over and over and over. And I agree with the minister, enough's enough. That's where it starts. And I think I represent about 3,700 people that aren't here tonight. 
because we ran a campaign to save the golf course. And that hasn't even been brought up yet. But that one with the disinformation would be nice to know about. So in each of the directives, and, and as I noted in my uh, opening remarks, that um, this report is published online. There is also a requirement for the city of Chestermere to provide uh, residents of Chestermere with printed copies of the report uh, and also requires the city of Chestermere to post this report as well as the subsequent um, updated reports from the city addressing their work to address the directives. It is absolutely a requirement. I know that uh, the residents of Chestermere, in addition to good governance, also uh, ought to be able to expect transparency and accountability. And so this information will be posted on the Government of Alberta website. But as the directives pointed out, there is a requirement for the city of Chestermere to make that information available to all residents as well. Thank you. Next question, please. Hi, thank you. Um, sitting here, I actually just realized that I've been a resident of Chestermere 10 years today, uh, which is fun. I hopefully got an easy one. Specific to Directive 11, you referenced the requirement to share information with you about municipal land sales. Will that information also be made available to the public? So depending, and, and as you know, as many people in this room, I, I have received the correspondence uh, about a number of issues, uh, including this. Uh, it is not my position to determine uh, what happened or whether uh, those transactions were fair. So we have asked uh, or directed, I should say, uh, the CAOs to provide myself with a list of all municipal land sales as i mentioned uh, until we see what that information is it's hard to say if we'll be able to to make that public the ministry has to though receive that um, by the deadline of july 31st we do have another online question you good okay uh I'll, so the question reads uh, a lot has happened since september of 2022 uh, how can we have the negative events that have uh, occurred since September reviewed within the context of irregular, improper, uh, or Im improv sorry, improvident conduct, uh, specifically within the mayor's conduct related to the assault at City Hall and then potentially the KPMG audit? So, um... So, you know, we, we did talk about this being to September, so the, the person asking the question is quite right in terms of the scope of the inspection report and these findings. Um, that doesn't preclude, uh, you know, looking uh, at those types of uh, scenarios in the future, but um, for right now we're focused on uh, what we've found out since September. There are a couple of things that I would uh, sort of talk about with respect to uh, the KPMG report that's mentioned, and it's not specific to KPMG uh, specifically, but just to, um, you know, again, remind uh, folks of the directive that is in here related to uh, financial statements. And so uh, those are required uh, in this set of directives issued by the minister uh, so that we have audited financial statements in place and that uh, we get um, a plan into the ministry to be able to know what the approach will be for um, getting those in place by the timeline for both 2021 and for 2022 so that we have public transparency around the uh, the expenditure of funds and so that that pertains to that um, the other matter which was again a personnel matter sort of consistent with the question that was asked previously um, i've mentioned that that's not part of this review and is really a matter for um, you know, local police authorities to continue investigation and determine an outcome. Thank you. To the question at the back of the room, please. My name is Muktiar Singh Beans. I live in here at Chestermere for the last 10 years. I like to the ask the council or mayor when we moved in, so here is so many senior people living. Is anything here for the senior people? There's no arena, no pool, no bar we have to take a kids our back to the city 
far away from us and there's no hakirina why not they build here like a jancy place if city have something they should provide to some other land law big land owner to give them some land so they can open some arena so city can make some money out of that when the people come into heaven here a hockey game or swimming pool do something about it thank you for your comments sir i believe we're going to stick to the, the the subject matter at hand for tonight thank you very much though Next question, please. Hi, Robert Schindler. Uh, given these directives require action dates by after the provincial election, uh, how, will the, uh, uh, how will these impact uh, the directives being followed? Uh, could a new minister cancel them without completion? So in terms of the dates of the directives, uh, some of the, I think there's one or two that are essentially effective immediately. Um, the next deadline uh, or date where uh, the ministry and myself will be expecting submissions is the end of April, uh, the 20th of April, sorry. Uh, and so, I mean, it's hard for me uh, to then say what uh, a future government could do. These would be, um, the directives that would remain in place. Uh, and if there were to be a change, uh, again, I can't speak to what that would look like, but I would suggest that there would have to be significant consultation with the community. Um, but this report uh, was fair. Uh, it really was. I have reviewed every submission. I have reviewed the report multiple times. Um, you know, and I, I take these directives especially seriously. I do believe that the residents of Chestermere deserve good governance. Uh, I should hope that uh, City Council takes these directives to heart. Um, what we are asking here is nothing that is not being asked of all other municipalities across Alberta. We take this seriously. Um, and I would also just say that transparency and accountability are also very important. And so uh, I, I do hope that uh, no matter what happens, uh, these directives will remain in place until they are addressed. We do have another online question. Sorry, yeah, sorry. so we have a question from Don sorry, can here. Can I just interrupt for a sec? Sorry. sorry about that. I just thought I might add a bit of extra context for folks about the directives. Um, I wanted to reassure you the reasoning for the timing. Um, the timing is intended to give council the time they need to do things. So for example, on several occasions, several directives ask them to review or amend a bylaw. And we don't want that to happen kind of on one day. They need the legislation requires them to follow due process to do a bylaw. They need to, in some cases, do public hearings. We've asked them to engage the public on a lot of those. So the, the directives have been very deliberately timed, not to try and delay, but to say council needs a legitimate time to be able to succeed to get this work done. And the other thing is we didn't think we could make all the directives do at once because some of them do require a certain amount of, of, of effort. And it would be frankly unfair for us to say everything is due by April 30th or May 1st or whatever. So they're staged out very deliberately to give council a legitimate chance to succeed in doing each one of those efforts. So I just wanted to add that context. Thank you. Thank you. The online question? Yeah, so we have a question from Don online. Uh, can we expect public participation or comments to be allowed at council meetings in addition to council business? You know, there's a variety of ways in which public engagement is uh, entertained by councils across this country. Uh, the most predominant form is something called council um, delegations, which show up typically in the first hour or two of a council meeting, and people make appointments and they come in and speak about a particular topic. Sometimes they provide information in advance, sometimes not, and uh, the people have had a chance to express their point of view. Secondly, some councils provide a question and answer period at the end of a council meeting and, count, and whoever's in attendance or available through online services can ask their question and the council may or may not respond because it's simply a question period as opposed to providing answers. A third way is that council can hold a public gathering and have a question and answer period similar to this, typically not all that well attended, and uh, they can respond to questions that come up. In general, 
because the law requires council to have a public engagement process. In general, most councils seek every possible way that they can to get public input. Uh, and uh, the, the discouraging part of it is, is if council members find ways to discourage public input because they may not like what they're about to hear. So the, the, the answer should be that we as a council are trying our best to get public input. We have certain rules to follow, certain procedures, certain protocols, we expect them to be followed. And yes, we expect to hear from our citizens. Uh, my, my, my own hope is that this council, along with every council, finds every possible way to engage with its citizens and hear what they have to say. There's not, quite frankly, every council is faced with questions and criticisms, which sometimes aren't all that easy to bear because these folks are trying to serve, often, by the way, voluntarily across the country if their municipality is small, and they're trying to do their best, but in any case can still get set upon by people who think they've blown it one way or the other. So yes, there should be public engagement. Yes, there should be a process. Yes, it should be publicized. Yes, the citizens should be able to, should be encouraged to show up. Uh, and yes, the council should be, obviously council is there to listen as well as govern. So part of the governing is based on good listening. Thank you. We'll go to the question in the center of the room. Can I, can I just add as well um, that that would be addressed in directive three. Um, that would be the directive for Council to review their current procedural bylaw and determine what changes, if any, are warranted based on the findings of the inspection report. Um, and again, it is expected that these discussions are happening at an open Council meeting. Next question, please. Hi, I'm Rob Wojnowski. I've been here for seven years. I have two questions, and I'll try to make them quick. First one does relate to the financials. You can see there's a tone of interest regarding the financials with the CUI, also with some of the land sales. We understand that you're requesting the audited financials that are past due uh, with already a mistrusted council. Reviewing, asking for financials is one thing. Are you reviewing the financials to see also that our money is being well spent? And if not, what are the actions? Is that something that council has to address or is that where municipal affairs steps in? So I, I guess there's a couple of uh, questions in that one question. Um, so yes, the directive does uh, talk about needing an auditor uh, to essentially provide those, or review the financial statements in 2021 and 2022. Um, those do get submitted into Municipal Affairs and Assistant Deputy Minister Sandberg can talk a bit about the sort of things that we look for in terms of uh, some of our own um, measures uh, to, to ensure financial viability. But primarily those uh, financial statements are meant to provide the public, you, uh, with transparency and accountability for the expenditure of funds uh, that are being made by your council. And so again, sort of in accordance with some of the things we've talked about, respecting local government um, and the decisions that the decisions that you've made in terms of who you've elected and who you'll elect um, in future uh, elections and so forth. Part of that is about making sure you have the information that you need to ask questions um, and to uh, to be able to participate in in conversations around the use of those funds but it wouldn't be typically up to us to say whether or not we think that that's the right amount of money but we do look at them from a financial risk perspective anything you'd want to thank you robin we'll go to your second question thanks um my second question is you can see there's an expectation for council to potentially some members of council to resign if that happens how do we govern? Okay, um, I just want to clarify, I have your question right. Was the question, if enough council members resign, how would, you, how would, the, how would the community be governed? Was that the question in essence? Yeah, if they walk away from the responsibility of taking care of these directives mm -hmm. in the near term, I understand you've addressed some of the issues. If they don't address these in the long term, in the near term, if the mayor or other council members walk away from taking responsibility of 
resolving these directives, how do right. we resolve okay. council? Sure, thank you. Uh, so under the Municipal Government Act, um, council must have quorum, which in essence is a majority. So um, as long as any municipality has a majority of council seats filled, um, then council can continue to function. So in Chestermere's case, you have a seven person council. So as long as you have at least four council members, you have a council. Um, if for whatever reason, a municipality finds itself without quorum, in other words, with less than a majority of the council seats filled, um, the minister has the authority to appoint an official administrator. And let me just clarify, because there's two different kinds of official administrators. The kind of official administrator in place right now is an official administrator who supervises the municipality. The kind of official administrator I just talked about is an official administrator who actually acts as council because there is no council. And the job of the official administrator is to hold by-elections so that you would have a council again. So it's very, obviously in this case, extremely hypothetical, but in the case of any municipality where there was a lack of quorum for council, the minister would appoint an official administrator to serve as council with, in essence, the single role of getting by-elections conducted so that those positions would be filled and then you would have a functional council again. I hope that answers the question. Next question on the right side, thanks. Hi, my name is Evelyn Lacey. I'm also a member of Chestermere. Uh, we moved here a few years ago from out of province. And so I'm not completely up on all of the Alberta stuff, but uh, in our previous province, if there was an issue, we did have the capacity to initiate a recall. So if we wanted to recall the election based on whatever, and in this case, obviously election promises that are nowhere near being met. Um, is there such a process? Because I understand you guys as the government can't do it, but as we as citizens, can we recall this election? Yes, and so you're correct. In terms of the inspection process, um, the issuing of directives, allowing council to have time to meet the directives that is legislated and that has followed some other cases and so that is that is very specific uh, and laid out in a certain way so that there is enough time for an inspection report which we have had uh, and now there are directives in place and now there are expectations and directives that council must comply with by certain dates and then you know if if those are addressed then that is in the interest, the best interests of residents of Chestermere. And if not, additional actions can then be taken. To your question about recall, we did in fact proclaim recall legislation here in Alberta that I believe was in April of 2022. Um, so given the specifics around that, uh, the, the citizens have an ability to petition for the recall of an elected uh, municipal official 18 months after the official has been elected. So for councillors elected in late October of 2021, the recall process could begin in late April of 2023. The next question on the side of the room, then we're going to go to the front after that. And then there's one more at the back, I believe afterwards. Hi, uh, Deb Hitchcock, 20 year resident. My question is, is there a threshold for numbers, the number of directives that are not followed? before the minister decides there is dysfunction continuing and will not take next steps to remove members of council. So there is not a specific number of directives that have to be met. Um, I would expect that they are all met, including the ones that are to begin immediately uh, and the ones with the deadlines of April 20th. Of course, we want to be reasonable. If there was uh, an unforeseen circumstance where council reached out and uh, you know addressed a reason uh, why they might need a small extension or um, provided some rationale around why they needed a little bit more time, I mean, I, I think we could be reasonable, but essentially, as I've said tonight a number of times, I expect that these directives are met by the timelines that are put forward. And I believe there's one more question from the, from the side there. Uh, is, do all directives have to be met? The expectation is that all directives are met and met by the timelines that have been put forward.
Next question at the front, please. Okay, we've got one more at the back, and then we'll check to see if there's any online ones after that. Um, I'm Amber Patterson. I've lived here for 10 years. Uh, just as a millennial, we access our information online a lot of the time, and I found it very difficult to um, wade my way through some of the information to trust or not. I was wondering if you could let us know where to access um, truth, <laughs> where to access appropriate information, where to access the true information. Absolutely. So I do believe that we can have that, uh, the Alberta.ca, I believe it's slash Chestermere. Oh, excellent. Uh, so that information to the government of Alberta website is right behind me. Um, but there is, as I mentioned tonight, an expectation that uh, this information will also be posted on the city of Chestermere website as well. And that's a requirement of the directives that we've put forward. I believe we're going to take one more question from the back of the room, and then any further questions after that, I encourage you to email them into the address on the screen, please. Go ahead with your question. Sorry, it's more of a comment to end the night then. Um, just a clarity, when we look at this room and we look at the residents here and we think about all of the different people that this re represents, that there are four people that are not here tonight, whereas there are three that are. And so I would simply want to remind those that are here and those that are not here who is here and why that matters. So that's it. Thank you, everybody, for your questions tonight and being engaged. Uh, thank you for coming on this for, and listening to this important matter. Obviously, this impacts a lot of residents of Chestermere. I encourage you to take the handouts home with you and visit alberta.ca slash Chestermere for the full report and more information. Any follow-up questions can be sent to Alberta Municipal Affairs to the email address behind me, which is map.gov.ab.ca. Thank you and good evening. Once again, have a good night.